Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. I am very pleased today to have an incredible guest, something very dear to my heart. Lily Oglesby, she works with children. She prepares them for the world at a very, very young age uh, in their grade school, teaching them about gardening, permaculture, nature, and she's also teaching them dance. Lily, thank you for being on the show today. Thank how, you for having me. How are you today? Doing great, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So your work is very, very beautiful and very, very important. You have a signature on your email, and it's so profound and so beautiful. Right. Um, it says, if we, ex if we are going to expect children to save the planet, we need to teach them to love it first. What so. does this really mean to you? Um, I think, it, for me, it just means so many people, children and adults, are very disconnected from the natural world, and yet there's all this talk, you know, we have to save the oceans, we have to save the forest. There's some people who've never been to the oceans, who've never been in a forest, and so the work that I do, um, in particular through one of the organizations I work with, Next Generation, is... Um, is getting kids to the ocean, out in the forests, or just out in their own, you know, schoolyard garden, connecting with the natural world, so that they have that bond, that understanding, that lends itself to love of the natural world. And then, and it's just more of an embodied experience with the natural world. Well, then people, they care more. I believe that people care more when they have that connection. Your personal experience, as mm -hmm. you, as a young child, what mm -hmm. exposure did you have to nature, yeah. to the natural world of plants and mm -hmm. gardening? Mm -hmm. um, well, I actually grew up in cities in San Francisco, Milwaukee, and Seattle. Um, it was really my summers where I got uh, that nature exposure that just um, is an absolute essential part of who I am, and I'm so thankful for it. And that were, in particular, it was the summers in um, in Door County, northern Wisconsin, that I would spend with my grandmother, who lived in the woods on the edge of Lake Michigan, and she was a very nature-connected woman. And we would, you know, go out into the forest picking wild raspberries and and seeing the birds and snapping turtles and you know the little critters that lived around and she was just such a magical being and the way she exposed me to her environment just really opened my eyes to wow this is magical and, and I love this and um, and also um, my dad um, who lives in LA um, and moved there when I was four but when I would visit him on holidays we would always get out in the trails whether in Griffith Park or Runyon Canyon or up in Santa Barbara and so those those trail walks those hikes with my dad also were very very much an important part of, of um, uh, creating my my nature connection and love of the natural world so in yeah. essence the elders gave you and they were setting the pace and tone of what would be happening now and mm -hmm. now you are doing what they had given to you mm -hmm. and you're passing this on to children and you go mm -hmm. to elementary schools mm -hmm. and, and middle and high school yes mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. the experience like when you're in the schools with the children um, well, I feel very thankful to get to be outside with the kids. Um, it's sometimes pretty painful to me <laughs> to have to be inside of a fluorescent lit classroom on a beautiful day. So I'm so thankful that a lot of my work is outside, whether it's in the, the garden, um, the school gardens, and Marin just has an abundance of school gardens. It's wonderful here in this county, um, just the commitment to that uh, awareness and that education, nature awareness, garden education. Um, and then I'll also do, we'll do nature walks around the campus or sometimes off the campus. One of the schools I work at, San Pedro Elementary School in San Rafael, um, I do weekly bay walks with the kids, which is um, where we get to walk the bays. I mean, it's an amazing location for the school. It's just about a quarter of a mile to the bay and um, I'll walk with them and then we'll wend our way into this sort of beautiful grassy area where I get to teach them about some of the amazing wild edibles and wild medicinals that are growing and we get to do little you know tastings of wild radish flowers and and fennel and you know some of the amazing edible plants that are growing around and um, yeah, so it's just really special. Similarly in the garden, doing you know sense, sensory awareness exercises, just opening up their awareness of what's around them and the beauty of all that's growing in the garden and you know, then very 
practical, you know, hands-on in the soil, weeding, seeding, um, growing their own food in the garden. Yeah. And what sense do you have that it's of how it's affecting the children in, in a positive way? There's some children who are introverts or they are troubled, mm -hmm. and being with nature, all of this seems to just fall away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What have you seen from your experience of being with the children? Well, I've seen that just nature is very soothing. It's soothing to the spirit, soothing to to the physical body. It just it tends to calm the kids. And it's very real, you know? It's not like video games or all this just hyper-stimulation that kids are exposed to um, that I think kind of spins them out. I think ADD and, you know, though I'm no doctor or anything, like, but you know, these ADD disorders and things of that nature, I think it has, has a lot to do with our culture and, and, and the kind of um, excessive technological exposure that a lot of kids have. So when we get out in the garden or we go to the edge of the ocean or the edge of the bay, it's just really, it's very real, it's very calm, you know. It's, it, it tends to allow kids to drop into themselves more and get curious, you know, and, and get hands-on, you know, video game, yeah, you're using your thumbs a mile a minute, but it's you're not. It's not as tactile. You know what I mean. So, um, yeah, that. And then it just yeah, it it opens their curiosity and um, and and then there's also a real sense of achievement that can come because sometimes these walks, particularly if you know they're first or second graders, and even if it's just a quarter of a mile each way, that can seem like a long walk, but you know, they get there, they get back, and there's a real sense of accomplishment. So I think being out um, in nature, I know I've done overnights with youth fifth graders in the Marin Headlands, and man, to watch the transition within 48 hours of when the kids arrive and when they leave, just how much more well, relaxed they are. Um, and just that sense of empowerment that comes with like, I just I went on a night walk or a night hike and I did it, you know, and I was away from home for two nights out in nature, like, yeah, you know, just, yeah. So it's very empowering for youth. Do you do a lot of identification of the plants and the flowers? Mm-hmm, yeah. And what studies have you done? Uh, I know you read a lot of books. Mm-hmm. So what are your favorite books and what have you done in a way to prepare yourself for this? Right, well for me, I learn best hands-on. So I've learned from other um, local teachers and um, through some of the programs that I've done um, like at the Regen through the Regenerative Design Institute in Bolinas, um, RDNA uh, is one of the programs they offer the Regenerative Design Nature Awareness Program. That was a 1500 hour program I did that was very hands-on and it was two nights a week, 48 hours a week, so we were there for two straight days. Um, just learning about the local flora and fauna and uh, it was pretty amazing and camping out there and um, and similar and then the books support you you know I have all the great local um, wildlife books um, the Audubon has some some great ones and I've taught through the Audubon um, and uh, they have a really nice bookstore that I've purchased them from but just about local trees local plants the local birds I love my bird books or even just the there's this series of laminated cards I forget who puts them out exactly where it's just a fold-out card it just has the most predominant species in the area whether that's butterflies or birds or plants and so it's good to start small you know instead of like yeah there's thousands of birds out there that one could learn but just start with like what are the ones that you're seeing most often in your area and then just really get to know them even if that's just five that's five those are five you know species of bird that you're building a really um, rich and connected relationship with so it's not just exclusive to plants oh no it's birds the animals yeah the insects the, the yeah. whole ecosystem the whole ecosystem yeah mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. yeah it looks like yeah. it's giving you a lot of joy that you're bringing a lot of joy to the children so it's yeah. it's very sustaining for you also yeah, definitely. I mean, I just, I feel, as I said before, there is a lot of magic in the natural world that really, um, it sort of holds that mystery that for me really feeds my spirit. I don't need to know everything. And when I get out in nature, I realize I don't know everything. In fact, I'm far, far from it. And that's okay, because it's just, um, it's very expansive. And, um, and yet even in the tiniest, detail of watching the teeniest tiniest insect there's just 
it just completely opens your sphere, you know. Um, I was just talking to someone earlier about spherical awareness, and that's something we would talk about in my, as I mentioned earlier, our, what is a spherical awareness? Our, our DNA program. Um, spherical awareness, just that idea, and I, I do it with the kids too, often in our lives we're very here, um, mm -hmm. looking at a computer screen, driving. Um, so I start with the kids of, you know, uh, sort of, opening up our periphery and I have them wiggle their fingers as they stare straight ahead and start to open up this part of their viewing and and then we practice something called and that would be called owl eyes um, and we also practice something called a fox walk which is walking stepping very consciously um, similar to how a fox would if he's you know stalking something but so that he hears everything he's aware of everything going on around him and um, and the ego, so, seeing the big picture, yeah, and soaring just, above and seeing right, and all. above and below, and so that whole sphere that's around mm -hmm. us, so that when we are on a trail, for instance, we're not just you know straight ahead, I'm going there, but we're noticing, oh my gosh, there's a deer over there, or a raccoon, you know, and just really starting starting to pay attention. I think um, the kind of nature awareness work that I've been grateful enough to get to learn and practice um, and be exposed to um, just really, it's, it's, it, it cultivates awareness, a deep awareness, mm -hmm. both in the forest or in a city. You know, I, ever since my eyes and ears have been attuned to, to the world of birds, um, I see the Cooper's Hawk in, on the telephone wire in downtown San Francisco, you know, something that I might not have been aware of before when I was younger. Just, it opens you up to all that's going on, and that's pretty, pretty special. So it's a lot like the magical child, mm. just being open and being mm -hmm. in the experience and mm -hmm. opening up your awareness to allow a, a greater sense of, of self mm -hmm. and the possibilities of what is there. Right, right. So you yeah. see the children, I mean, they can bring that back into their life and, mm -hmm. and use that also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot. It is not very obvious here, but it, it seems to be a very profound thing. Right. Yeah, very profound. And then they take it and they start to teach their parents what they're learning, you know, when they're out at the park or someone gets stung at the park and, oh, that's plantain, I know how to use that, put it on the bee sting and, you know, help help soothe the pain. So, yeah, again, that empowering and they're not, it's not only the elders passing it to the younger generations, but vice versa, because a lot of adults haven't had that exposure in our culture, you know, which is which is unfortunate. But I think that, you know, with such books as um, Last Child in the Woods and others of that nature, like definitely, um, and and the new disorder that's been coined, um, nature deficit disorder, the awareness of how disconnected we've become, be, we've become from the natural world, is really is much more on the radar now than it it was, ever was, or at least in the past. Well, if you years. were to write a book, <laughs> mm -hmm. what would you put in that book? Oh, if I was to write a book. Um, I feel like I'm still learning from so many of the wonderful books mm -hmm. that are out there. But, um, well, to presence another one of my loves, I'm also a dance dancer and dance teacher. And um, embodiment practices are also very important to me. And I see the duo as, as so powerful of... Um, knowing how to drop into your body, whether that's with yoga or dance, and simultaneously be in the natural world and um, having that open your awareness. Because sometimes, you know, if we go straight from the computer to, you know, maybe the ocean side, it might take us a while to really drop in. We can stay very in our head. Granted, the natural world in and of, in and of itself can drop us in, but I think if we're you know, knowing how to move our bodies and listening to our bodies and simultaneously listening to the natural world, that duo can really help to, again, expand our awareness. And so, it would be it would it would be a book along the lines of where embodiment practices and the natural world meet. I don't know. I haven't thought much about writing the book. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm currently writing a, a musical around nature, so that's exciting. But yeah. a musical around mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. What would that say? Um, it's about, um, oh, it's very fresh, but um, basically um, through music and dance, well, it's a musical about um, the connection of youth to the natural world and um, 
where that sort of concrete disconnect um, meets the natural world and how we can bring the natural, like, you know, everyone's not going to be able to move out to a farm or a ranch. The reality is millions of people live in cities, but it doesn't have to be dire straits, you know, rooftop gardens and just all the creative ways that people are trying to cultivate um, the natural world and that awareness wherever they are. And so the musical touches upon that. So would this be mm -hmm. a play or would this It's a musical. A musical? Yeah. yeah, so songs and yeah. But it's very new. I, I so it's, 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 it's like an uh, art performance, mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where do you see this going in the future, in the near future? And how, I mean, we know it's very important. Mm -hmm. And the budgets are being cut. And I mean, I just hold hope that, uh, as I said, this, this idea of nature def deficit disorder and the need for us to connect more to the natural world will stay on the radar and continue to just, you know, get more and more bright on the radar. Um, and that um, nature awareness work, nature um, garden classes just become more and more a part of the curriculum where, you know, like they've done at the Edible Schoolyard in Oakland, um, or is it in Berkeley, anyways at the Edible Schoolyard at Martin Luther King Middle School in the East Bay, um, how they've really seen how you can weave in to the math curriculum, science curriculum, history, language arts, you know, this um, gardening and nature connection um, learning as well, how they're inextricably linked. And I would just love, I mean, that is just an amazing prototype for what I would love to see um, in all schools and for all kids. Um, yeah, I don't think kids are meant to be in a classroom six, hour, six, seven, eight hours a day in a desk. I mean, I know they have many recesses, but even those are being cut back, you know, um, under fluorescent lighting. So I think, yeah. <laughs> you also teach dance. What type of mm -hmm. dance would this be? Um, I teach, primarily right now, I teach a creative movement, modern and ballet, um, although I've taught um, when I taught in the public schools on a regular basis for three years, I would do different units with the kids. So they'd get West African, which I've studied pretty extensively, and a Latin unit, jazz, modern ballet, um, to get you know an awareness of different different styles of dance. And yeah, so mm. yeah, elementary through middle and some high school dance teaching and yoga I always have to throw some yoga in there and the youngest age you're teaching dance would be? preschool as well yeah so four-year-olds mm -hmm. which is really fun it's you know each each age group is so so very mm -hmm. different so yeah what is the main difference you see between children who have not been exposed to nature who are not doing the dance classes who are not tapping into that creative side of them Mm -hmm. who are very much, as you mentioned, on the computers and mm -hmm. there's a total disconnect. Mm -hmm. There must be an obvious difference there between the two. Right. Um, well, I tend to see the most, in my experience working with youth, um, and for instance, I will, just to be specific, some camps I've run through an organization called Trackers Northwest that's now has a, it's started up in Portland, but they now have a, um, a program here in the Bay Area, in Marin, in the East Bay, and San Francisco, all over, um, is working with youth who've gone through the um, more mainstream schooling and then youth who have been homeschooled. And of course, youth who have been homeschooled who are in these programs, it's because the parents want them to have this nature education. But I just noticed they also tend to have um, just a lot of cool, um, hands-on learning that they're exposed to because they're um, homeschooled and there's just more flexibility with what they're exposed to and so there's tends to be um, just more of a curiosity and an openness um, from these kids and as well as just youth who've had more of the nature exposure um, curiosity openness um, they tend to be less um, uh, well that's not entirely true Nature connected kids can be know it alls too, <laughs> but I was going to say just um, even more humble. I don't know if that's true because they've seen the the grander picture in a way, if you will. Like I, I notice a lot of kids who are just in front of the computers or with their Game Boys, 
or televisions, you know, a lot of what they share, it's all, it's a lot of pop culture, you know, it's constant pop culture, this and this and that, and, um, mm. Is it possible that the children who are experiencing nature and the dance mm -hmm. classes and the artistic side of themselves and mm -hmm. the expression of self, mm -hmm. they are more balanced, they are seeing the possibilities where they're more curious, mm -hmm. it's fostering the curiosity and the more yeah. where perhaps the other children who have not been exposed to this mm -hmm. are more close-minded. Yeah, perhaps. no, curiosity is a key is a key word, connection, curiosity, creativity. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely, I just feel like it, nature connection just touches that tip of the iceberg, you know, of curiosity and, oh, once you question this, then that leads to this question, you know, it's endless and that's really exciting. Um, whether you're a know-it-all or not, because you can't really ultimately get to the, the be-all and end-all. Um, but uh, yeah, so it definitely engenders that curiosity, which is really exciting. And because being out in nature oftentimes, like I was uh, mentioning earlier, is a, is a physical experience, is an embodied experience. Whether it's you know climbing a tree or going for a hike or um, pitching a tent, you know it's more physical. So kids tend to be in their bodies and have to depend on their their own resources, the resource of their body, um, as opposed to like a television clicker. So there's again that sense of um, self empowerment that comes. Well, let's talk about the Pacifics, of, or is there a difference between the boys and the girls? Is there an obvious difference? when they're out in nature mm. that you observe? That's interesting. Um, I mean, of course, I think it depends on the individual mm -hmm. child. Um, they're, you know, I don't know. I'm still hesitant to make generalizations, but they do exist. Um, sometimes the boys tend to be a little more rowdy, wanting to <laughs> run everywhere ah, and pull up the rocks and crabs, let's smash them, you know. <laughs> there's, there's a, a little more of a, I think, a sensitivity that girls sometimes bring. Younger kids, you know, not necessarily the older kids. And the girls are doing, what are they doing uh, as the boys are? I mean, they want to see the crabs. The they want to see the crabs too, and, um, and they're not always the most, you know, um, suave with putting the rock back so that all the crab, the whole crab family doesn't get crushed. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just not quite the same heightened, like, you know, rampaging. So right. that, that's part of my work, too, is like, okay, let's rein it in. That's really exciting to run all over. But let's start to, like, notice the details. And, um, and how do the boys do with acting like a fox walking through there, as you mentioned, or the owl? Do they immediately drop down into that as the girls would? Or is it easier for the girls to do it or the boys? I wouldn't say that. I, I would, you know... Um, I mean, in learning it, they both, I'd say, pick it up pretty on par with each other. Um, Is there a resistance yeah. from the boys to do it or not? No, I think they like, they enjoy it too. Boys okay. and girls, you know, they, mm -hmm. they want to be the stalker. They want to be really aware. They don't want to, you mm -hmm. know, it's a little sort of that like, I'm a hunter through the forest kind of <laughs> or something. So when you make it a yeah. magical journey and mm -hmm. a, a story that's a, about to be explored, then they can lose themselves in yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to presence totally it. have them presence and totally yeah. to engage them. Right, right, right. Yeah, like girls and boys alike. Again, and then at that point, I feel like it's an individual matter of the individual. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Well, where do you see this going in, in the future for you? Um, for you as a dance teacher and working with children? Mm -hmm. uh, again, just figuring out more ways to bring the two together, whether, that, whether that's writing a musical about the natural world for youth, I bet it's about youth too, um, or you know, just as simple as when I'm in the garden with kids, waking up our bodies, waking up our awareness with some yoga, and, um, and um, I mean, I've also similarly contemplated having a, a show that would be kind of a, a nature awareness version of Pee Wee's Playhouse. So it would be fun and spunky, but it would also be very much about exposing kids to, um, mm. to nature and that nature awareness. You seem so. to be giving us a lot of thought. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah.
Yeah, so. And always it's just fun to also make up songs around the natural world. I do that with kids a lot, bringing the musical career, eliciting the musical creativity in them. Like my green team at Venetia Valley School, we did a little let's make a song up about the garden and different groups of kids got together and worked on their song and then we performed them for each other and that was very sweet. So what green team and, and the, the garden mean to them. So. How many other teachers are out there doing the work that you're doing? Um, well, again, in Marin County, it's impressive how many gardens there are and funding grant money for garden teachers. Um, I think we have a pretty high concentration of gardens and garden teachers and garden edu education compared to um, definitely in Marin County and as well in the Bay Area, so compared to other areas in the nation. But it's happening all over, you know, that awareness is being raised. And, and I think as we're looking more and more at, um, you know, living local and, and that we do need to learn these practices, like I question how much longer food's going to be shipped from Asia or, you know, wherever. It's just not sustainable. It can't happen for much longer. I mean, not to get too dark, but we've already mined 90% of the lithosphere, which is, you know, under the soil where all the fossil fuels reside. So we just can't keep going at this rate. So we have to think this way. And so I would imagine that particularly when push comes to shove, it's going to have to be a part of what we teach in schools. Yeah. Well, since Al Gore, we've been talking about climate change mm -hmm. and all the possibilities and, and there's been a lot of unknowns, a lot of fear, and then the scientists are saying one thing. And, mm -hmm. But recently they're agreeing that there is something going on and something has to be addressed and looked at mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So this is a credible way to start mm -hmm. of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if the children are engaged and asking for that, like before they were not, in, like in the other generations, mm -hmm. in the 50s and the 60s, Mm -hmm. uh, the 60s, yes, mm -hmm. there was a consciousness happening at that time where mm -hmm. they were very much connected to the planet and, and trying to disconnect from the work and the corporate world and they wanted their own voice. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is not going to be the 60s again. The mm -hmm. 60s was that. Mm -hmm. So now there's a awareness that children, more so now, they are the younger generation is saying, no, this planet matters, mm -hmm. and I want my voice to be heard in, mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. issue. Right, yeah, definitely. I mean, and just to roll back as far as um, what I also try to really, the message I try to get across to the kids is it all starts with our imagination. You know, we're living one way on this planet, but that doesn't mean it's the only way to live. And you guys are the next generation. And it's about thinking up new and sustainable, and not just sustainable, but thriving, you know, renewable ways to live on the planet that take care of us in a really awesome and healthy way and take care of the planet Mother Earth. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we have it in us. We've already created so many. For now, it, right now, it's just a matter of um, it's where we spend our money. And, uh, you know, oil companies have put a lot into the car, for instance. And um, from, you know, GM buying up all the rail in the 60s and ripping it out of Marin County. We had an amazing light rail system in Marin County up until then. Um, and of course, as we know in LA, Ford did Ford Company did the same thing there. I think earlier, though, uh, they also had an amazing light rail system. But Ford saw the potential of the car there, and so you know, it's just starting to say, okay, that's great. There was a lot of money there, but it's not going to serve us for much longer. And and so let's let's be creative and think think of. Um, uh, just new ways like that that movie who killed the electric car kind of touches upon mm -hmm. it's all already there it's just a matter of shifting the dollar to something more meaningful and sustainable yeah. well let's explore that a little bit further in an ideal perfect world mm -hmm. what Lily would you think would be, be the balance here between technology mm -hmm. we can't make technology go away mm -hmm. we need it it's here to stay Mm -hmm. and the nature mm -hmm. and the respect for both of these. Mm -hmm. um, 
Not being a techie myself, I, to a degree, would say maybe technology is here to stay. I don't know if I believe that, quite honestly. It feels awfully ephemeral, and when things crash, I could see that world crashing too. Um, and you know, th though it is very useful, I see for myself as my own sort of experiment, when I am in front of a computer screen too long, it, there's a shutdown that happens. I don't see as clearly my capacity to connect with real life, so to speak, gets a little funky. Gets, um, there's something constrictive in the computer and disconnecting um, as much as it's supposed to connect us all, you know. Um, so anyways, just to say that, but as far as my ideal where those two would meet, um, Personally, I would like to see a lot less technology. I would like to see kids with their heads in computer screens and iPods or iPhones um, go way down. And I don't know if that means just a, a death to the iPhone. <laughs> I don't have a cell phone. I hope that I never do. I had one for eight months when I lived in London and that was enough. Um, they don't feel good to me. And just recently, I mean, I know it's been out for a while, but I've had so many people come up to me about, you know, the radiation cancer studies with cell phones. And I'm like, yeah, they're not, it's not healthy. It's not good for us. And a friend who is, though he's a computer program, he's also studies um, body work a lot. And he talks about how literally when you're in front of a computer too long, your spine sort of lifts in your body. And if you sort of, you sort of play with that, it does it sort of feels like your head kind of floating on top of your body. You know, and we need to ground our feet more. There's this whole movement called earthing yet another term but what is um, it's getting barefoot on the earth more because we're mm. so disconnected with concrete with rubber on our shoes mm. i mean there was a time where we walked on the earth a lot more and so, so it's the version of the 60s that we were talking about it's a version of thousands of years ago too yes. you know and yes. i i'm thankful that I, I live in a beautiful home that has surrounding uh, land in a redwood, little redwood grove where I can do that. And I feel mm -hmm. the difference, you know, if I've been in my car a lot one day, just to like, it helps to, you know, because I think that energy, what happens is we end up, and they've been shown, they've shown how our bodies can't figure out ways to release it because those channels are cut off, that we kind of hold it inside of ourselves and it leads to that anxiety, that tension and a lot of illness, mm -hmm. you know, too. But if we can take the shoes off, get on the earth, just let it go, you know, it's that, that release. And so, I mean, woo to some, woo woo to some, but I guess that's, yeah. There was a recent study of the mm. honeybees. They were dying mm. in massive amounts, and they were saying that it was because of the cell phone uh, radio frequency right. in the towers. Right, yeah. That's, I find, I'm, it's very concerning to me. I, I love the honeybee dearly, and whenever I see one, <laughs> I send them a prayer because I'm very concerned about the state of the honeybee, and in particular, I remember reading a few years back a quote by Einstein, um, who was a very nature-connected man for all his, you know, anyways, um, that when the last honeybee leaves the planet, humans will have something like three to five years left. And again, that just speaks to our connection, and we can't keep abusing other species for our own benefit whether conscious or unconscious i don't think when they made the cell phone they're like oh yay we're gonna mess with the honeybee mm -hmm. but we have to be aware of these things because they're well they're super important to the pollinating of the food we eat you know so our crops and um so yeah a lot of love to the honeybee and uh and that it makes me angry quite honestly um and again as someone who doesn't have a cell phone I'm like these darn things again messing with <laughs> with more natural cycles you know so yeah so it seems to be you're channeling this anger into something very positive oh though. yeah oh I don't go around it I mean I'm just Absolutely. gonna love as much as I can and, and mm -hmm. enjoy the natural world as much as I can and do what I can because um, yeah I've seen I you know I have I've worked with people activists who um, run that more angry energy and it just kind of I think eats you up and yet anger is not a bad thing if it's a good you know impetus catalyst mm -hmm. to to get you doing what you care about and and taking action how about Greenpeace what is your idea on what they're doing and how they do it you I know, mean they, they have a very radical approach yeah and there's it's fueled by a lot of uh, anger and a lot of uh -huh. Passion, of course. Passion, yeah, dedication. I mean, I think some people, you know, everyone's running something different. 
through their system or have a different reason for doing what they're doing. I haven't followed Greenpeace a lot, a lot of late, um, uh, but yeah, I am aware of some of the work they've done, and some of it I think it's awesome. Like, you know. Um, going after those whaling ships who refuse to to stop whaling these amazing creatures and jumping on board and like putting up their signs and yay you know so there's this apathy that's spread throughout the land um you know if there's a return to the 60s I w one would hope that uh it would be a return to more of uh, more of that passion and less of the apathy that humans have right. it, of the, in this age seem to have fallen into um so no, we when it's about violence so i don't i can't recall any um and again i haven't followed them extensively greenpeace but instances of violence but when it's that kind of gung-ho like get the message out you know these guys are you know whether it's japan or or norway going after the whales in a gung-ho fashion there has to be a counter movement to that and May, may have to be gung-ho too, you know, so um, I don't know if I could do that, but yeah, more power to those who are going out. Yeah. So. There's a lot of micro-movements happening in Africa where the tourism is depending on the money, where before the poachers were making the animals extinct. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, and these cultures, they're coming in and they're mm -hmm. saying, well, you can make a lot of money here and mm -hmm. here's how to do it. Mm -hmm. Stop doing the poaching and bring in the tourism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's working together in a very positive way. Right. Uh, when it gets down to, should I poach? And if I don't poach and kill this animal mm -hmm. that I know I should not be killing, because mm -hmm. I was told not to kill mm -hmm. it, but I have to feed my family, mm -hmm. and this is the way to get money. Mm -hmm. My belly is hungry here, mm -hmm. so I have to have some money. Mm -hmm. So now they have offered them other alternative solutions, mm -hmm. so it's in a very powerful, positive right. way. Right, right, yeah. And I think this is a very akin to the possibilities that, that should be happening more. When I speak right. of Greenpeace, mm -hmm. I think also of the ideas that we need to find ways that, that yes, we'll say, do not do that, mm -hmm. but yet, what else can we do mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. that we're saying mm -hmm. not to do? Exactly. Other solutions are there. Yeah, yeah. Just to say, do not do that, is yeah. not, it's, it's, it's not enough. Yeah, like anything, I think when you remove something, there's going to be an empty space, a void there, and you need to be pretty quick with what you want to, or have mm -hmm. a, a creative um, understanding of what you want to fill that space with. And I was just talking to a friend the other day of, um, there's a lot of people who need work on the planet right now, and in my ideal world, that work would be about, you know, would be permaculture, would be about regenerating um, areas on the planet, and they are, they are vast, that we have ravaged. Um, and um, yeah, how to create income for people through that kind of work, um, and so, and that's one example of you know instead of killing these amazing creatures, um, let's just open up the you know the tourist industry also has some drawbacks too, but of the two, it's it's definitely much better. Let's get people in here to appreciate mm -hmm. and love. What will these be the creatures. drawback on the tourist? Oh well, you know, like for instance, on the Galapagos Islands, um, the wear and tear that comes from the tourist industry and the boats dumping their garbage, the tourist boats um, dumping their garbage. And this is coming from I actually I did go to the Galapagos for seven days, and they're amazing, and I will never forget that experience. So, um, yeah, it's it, it, and you know certainly green green eco companies, um, green hotels, green, 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 and hopefully green's not just a guise for do whatever, but they're really, you know, mm -hmm. um, coming from a place of integrity. That's great. So leave leave less of a footprint. So the idea there. of green and sustainable would be what? It would be to recycle? Yeah, and recycling, not, and not just dumping. Like if you are in a ship, I mean, uh, cruise ships are have a history for being a reputation for being very destructive because they just dump all their crap right in the ocean you know mm -hmm. but of yeah being more aware of how what you do with that maybe bring it back to land and sort it recycle <laughs> like compost it you know so um yeah and the solution as we spoke about the mm -hmm. initiative to want to do that would be that they could make money from doing that and it wouldn't be more work for them to do that 
Right, right. Well, that's the ticket is finding out um, ways so that people, I mean, a lot of people do it because they do care about the earth, and that's, an, that's enough of a um, reason right there, but how to make it. Um, but is there a lot, the same amount of eco people that yeah. don't care about no, that's the right. earth? Yeah, so, so yeah, bringing they get consciousness money back into what they can do mm -hmm. to balance it all mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So your work is incredible, and your journey as, from this moment as you go forth, how do you see yourself looking back in hindsight if you did not have this awareness that you had from your elders when you were a small girl? Mm. Um, Where do you think you would be today, and who would you have been today without all of this? I think it would be a sadder existence, and definitely not as healthy of an existence. Um, I, when I moved out of San Francisco five years, five and a half years ago, I, um, I was done with all the concrete and all that, the noise. And, um, and though it's funny when I think like, what are my clearest memories is what either like early in the morning at dawn or at dusk in just some of those gems, you know, San Francisco is a beautiful city as far as cities are considered, but the, just those um, gem little nature spots that, you know, are throughout the city and, um, just having that quiet time. I just desperately wanted more quiet time and drop-in time. And since moving up to Marin, um, yeah, I feel very thankful for the, the more soothing energy that I've been surrounded by and can fall asleep at night listening to the sound of the crickets and seeing the stars are all the more clearly than I ever could in the city. And, and I know I'm very, you know, lucky to have this. Not everyone, not everyone has that option. But I think it's been invaluable to um, waking me up to myself, waking me up to the planet, and, and allowing me for me, allowing me to be a healthier creature on the planet. So, mm -hmm. I lived in New York City for quite a length of time, and New Yorkers don't leave the island. <laughs> They have, they have no want to do that. Mm -hmm. They go from, from their office to their nightclubs mm -hmm. and to their environments. And uh, they, have, they have no idea that what nature would be about. And they have no concern to want to even know about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very particular city of unlike any other city mm -hmm. that exists like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have an incredible park, which mm -hmm. would represent, uh, Central Park would mm -hmm. represent nature, but mm -hmm. do they seldom get there? Well, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you say sad that you would not be the person who you are today, mm -hmm. what kind of sadness would that be? I mean, in, and how would that be affecting you that you could possibly look back in hindsight and say, well, I was given this incredible gift from my mm -hmm. elders mm -hmm. to introduce me to what nature is, mm -hmm. and you embraced it. Mm -hmm. But let's say you were not exposed to that, and what would the sadness be? Well, I don't know if I'd never been exposed if I was knowing what I was missing, but I can say my idea of who I would be is that... Um, I noticed when I lived in the cities, where I am in the cities, it's it's very much a human vibe that you're you're looking to other humans to to move you and to you know stir you up. It's it's very much about um, our human connections. That's that's what feeds us. And um, I've even well, <laughs> I don't want to get into this, but um, and that when we're more connected to the natural world it allows us for me it allows me to connect to myself more and realize that there's this whole that much vaster beyond the human web of connection that exists um, that though the human web is profound is equally sometimes if not more profound and that that it's sort of this sense of again that self-empowerment that has come through that connection um, and I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but almost less, less of a neediness. Um, though of course I still need my friends and family and love them. Um, my time in nature and the quiet time in nature through the years has just allowed me to drop into a place in myself, that still quiet place, that being able to touch that place, I'm fine and I'll always be fine no matter what happens. Um, and though maybe you could find that in a, in a room in the city, 
through meditation or something, I'm really thankful because I love the natural world that I've found that out there. And um, um, yeah, so I mean, just in a, if I was having an interesting conversation with a girlfriend how when we lived in cities and, you know, there was more of this like needing to have a boyfriend, you know, you needed that, again, that sort of neediness to sort of feel completed or something. And it's been really interesting. Um, not that I was ever super needy in that way, I've always been fairly independent, but since being more in this natural, quieter realm, there's, there's just like, again, that sense of like, I'm fine, I'm okay, and just trusting that what'll come will come when it comes you know and I, I had that to a degree in the city too because granted I um, whether it's nature connection or just what I came into this life with understanding I ha tend to have a trust and that there's a flow to things and a synchronicity you know but um, I, I would, my nature connection has been invaluable in supporting that trust you know and that understanding so <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. There's been a lot of writers and great mm. thinkers that have walked that path. Frank Lloyd Wright, he had mm. a total reverence and respect for nature. Mm -hmm. That was the source energy to him. Whitman, there has been many, many people mm -hmm. who are of, of greats that mm -hmm. see that empowerment of that. Right. I would also think that uh, the art of meditation, the art mm -hmm. of self-realization, uh, mm -hmm. the art of quietness, and this is a great example when you are connected to nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're disconnecting from the chaos of the mind, mm -hmm. the, as you say, right. the, the civilization, the neediness, the interreaction mm -hmm. that can be the smaller part of the aspects of the human experience. Right. And the nature is introducing the children mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. but they may not have the awareness at mm -hmm. this point in time of exactly mm -hmm. what is happening, mm -hmm. but they know there's something, mm -hmm. something special and mm -hmm. unique here. Right, right, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, um, and the more I can just sort of awaken that in them, um, I feel like I'm doing my job, and I'm thankful to have that opportunity to share that, um, and uh, just empower Again, children and adults in that way, you know. Sharing what I've shared with my mother, for example, she's, you know, said thank you to me a, a few times just for having exposed her to that world and and that place of of um, just solace and you know peace. Yeah. You mentioned that the children come home and start talking to the parents and bringing this information of their nature experience back to the parents. Mm -hmm. Do the parents ever go with you, with the children, at, mm -hmm. at some times where they have that relationship together? Oh, totally, yeah. I did a field trip not too long ago to um, Stinson Beach. It was an Earth Day field trip. and. Um, we were doing art on the beach. Zach Pine is the man who runs the program each Earth Day or weekend before Earth Day. And, um, and we were also doing a litter cleanup. And I took a group of about, I think it was 60 kindergartners, um, again, from San Pedro Elementary. And um, all, most of them had their parents or one or two parents with them. And um, I remember one of the moms commenting on how uh, she hadn't been to the ocean in five years. and. Um, how cool it was for her and and the day was supposed to wrap up at like we got there I think at 10 or 11 was supposed to wrap up at 3 but it was no easy task in pulling those kids away from the ocean side like and we hadn't brought swimsuits because it was a little chilly but you can imagine that every single one of them was drenched head to foot because it was just too exciting you know and I saw the just the smiles and the joy on the parents faces too and I don't know how many others perhaps had hadn't been to the ocean's edge and you know, several years. So even though we're in the Bay Area and it's right here, and um, but you know, again, sometimes if we don't have like a lot of them don't have cars, and uh, the parents who I of the youth I work with, um, or even if they do, a lot of people, you know, our bubbles can get small, and we forget about even if it's just a half an hour, 45 minute drive away. It's just not on our radar of what to do on, on a weekend, you know, so we don't do it. And, um, so yeah, that's great. So if parents want to contact you and put together a group mm -hmm. of uh, the children mm -hmm. and a group of their friends or mm -hmm. neighborhood groups, mm -hmm. and they want to contact you and have you to be their guide, mm -hmm. 
would you be open to this and how would they be able to contact you? Sure, um, they could contact me at Lily, L-I-L-Y, at Next Generation, I'm sorry, Lily, L-I-L-Y, at go, nextgeneration.org. That would probably be the best way, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be very exciting to see what you'll be doing in the future. And it sounds like you have a lot going mm -hmm. and a lot of experience that you will be sharing with us. And thank you. Thank you for all your beautiful, wonderful work that you've been doing and Great. are doing. Great. Thank you, Victoria. What final thoughts would you like to share um, with us that is very dear to your heart and important to you? Um, I would just say Wherever you can find some kind of open space, whether it's a park or a local creek um, or whatever speaks to you in that way, um, just try to get out there whenever you can and, and maybe make a commitment to getting out in that space on a regular basis. And it is, um, it can be just so surprisingly nourishing um, to ourselves and open us up. Uh, in ways that we couldn't have imagined and help. I think it also just, because the natural world's so real, it, it, um, it helps us to just wash away all that stuff that's kind of nonsense and that doesn't really matter in our life and get very real and on our path. And I think it really, Nature Connection really supports us in, in being on our path, whatever that may be. Um, you know, whether you're a doctor or um, a school teacher or whatever your calling is in this life, it just helps you all the more, supports you in getting aligned with that calling and going for it and, and trying to, washing away distraction. Though distraction's gonna be there too, but at least you can have the set time where, <laughs> quiet time and connection time, yeah. And for those who seldom get out to nature, mm -hmm. Just turn off the television. Yeah, go and just go on your balcony. Look at the sky and go for yeah. a walk. A walk, yeah. A short little walk. Yeah, and make that a new adventure. Oh yeah, yeah. As I said, even in the city, like I found my those times. Um, yeah, to connect. The sky's always above us, so that's a cool thing. You're mm -hmm. always going to see some kind of bird flying above. Well, one can only hope we'll always have the birds. <laughs> yeah, so. Do you think it's a possibility that we will not? I think if we keep going, the amount of birds that are becoming extinct on this planet is uh, pretty huge. Um, the different species that are becoming extinct, and I think if we keep treating the planet the way we're treating it, um, it's possible we won't have birds always. We may have pigeons, and they're fine, but I think most people would say they'd prefer to have other species of birds as well. So. Um, I do send a prayer to the birds too, because even in a house I lived in for five years, um, the woman who lived next door to me, she commented that in the time that we'd both been there, which was roughly the same, how fewer birds she was seeing, and um, yeah, so, <sighs> but on a wishful note, I think the more we connect with the birds and send them our love and try to do all we can to change our practices to support the planet, we will keep the birds with us. So And yeah. see the problem and come up with some workable solutions. Creative solutions. Yeah. Creative solutions. Well, yeah. well said. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lily, thank you very, very much mm. for being here today. And thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And the Art of Conscious Living, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.